Hello, everybody. Today, I'm going to put these panties in my mouth. I'm really looking forward to this. Are you ready? I'm looking forward to your panties. <laughs> I'm really looking forward to this, and we'll get, get going. So if you could give me your panties now, and we'll get, get going. That's beautiful. Thank you very much. Fantastic. They're still warm. Okay. Now, um, <laughs> they're very warm, as a matter of fact. I'm going to keep these panties, if you don't mind. The deal is, I'm going to put these panties... These still warm panties... These fantastic pair of panties in my mouth. In my mouth. I'm going to keep these panties in my mouth. Welcome to the Twin Peaks Podcast. So glad you're gone. I'm so glad you're gone. Fall in chain gone. Welcome to the Twin Peaks Podcast. I'm Matt. I'm Melanie. I'm Brad. I'm Caitlin. And this is our Mulholland Drive review. And today we've got two people with us. We've got Claire Lafar. Hello. Hello. Yay. Yay. <laughs> Yay. Oh. Thanks. <laughs> A different format screwed me up. I forgot to clap. Right. Okay. And uh, we've also got Evan Killam. Yay. Also. Yay. I get to follow Claire, all right. In no particular order. It was, it was order. by special request of myself. Uh, I'm just kidding. Mel has a secret grudge against Evan. <laughs> it's not really a secret. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so me and Mel and Caitlin and Brad have never seen this film before now. So would you, uh, would Claire and Evan, would you guys consider yourselves Mulholland Drive experts? I definitely am. I was even at the, the stage where I was like, I don't even think I need to rewatch the film to be on the episode because I know this film so well. But I did, so nice. yeah, I, I love this film. I don't think a Mulholland Drive expert exists. Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> that implies that there is anything to know about Mulholland Drive. <laughs> well, according to the internet, there's a lot of people that think they are. Yes. Oh, yeah. And they're awful. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was just on MulholandDrive.net where I was trying to make sense. <laughs> trying to make sense of this thing. Have you been there, Brad? Yes, I have. <laughs> okay. There's no less than 27 different theories on that list. Most of which are ridiculously nonsensical. It's about the uh, invasion of Iraq, right? <laughs> Obviously. 28? That was about 9-11. <laughs> it was about 9-11, and it was released like a Before. month after 9-11. They just went back and... Uh, it yeah. was a really quick production. You know, you could actually make an argument for that, but... Oh, yeah. <laughs> Conspiracy theorists can make an argument for anything. Or maybe they knew beforehand. Mm. I don't know what it means, so aliens. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Evan, you requested this one uh, specifically not long ago. Was it one of your favorites? or? Uh, well, there's a couple of reasons. It is my favorite uh, David Lynch, I guess, project, mm -hmm. just overall. And it's probably the last good David Lynch movie ever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What came after? Just straight story and in Inland Empire? Yeah, Inland Empire came after this, and he uh, has said that he's done with using film. Mm. Um, yeah. He wants to go digital, and if you've seen Inland Empire, you've not actually seen anything, because that movie is unwatchable. Uh, mm -hmm. Not yeah, the I least reason, because it is taken with a shitty handheld digital cam. Mm. And it's really, it's just ugly. It's so ugly. Yeah. And the rest of his films are really, you know, really beautiful to look at, the way they're shot and they're lit and everything. And it's just, it's an ugly, ugly film. Wow. Yeah, I've, I've been debating whether or not, like, 
we're doing most of Lynch's films, but I'm like, oh, there's like three that I didn't plan on doing because I heard they're bad, and I just don't know if we should do them anyways. Or... You have to do those. <laughs> wouldn't, those <laughs> wouldn't those just make much better episodes? Like, <laughs> yeah. They usually do. Maybe. Maybe. I think with all his films, there's a lot to talk about, so I think even if they're, you know, quote unquote bad or good films, they'd still make interesting episodes. Are you floating away? No. <laughs> I don't think so. It sounded like you were on your ceiling. <laughs> yes, I was floating up to my ceiling. <laughs> like Glinda the Good Witch. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to let uh, Brad and Caitlin go first on their first impressions of this one. Go for it, Caitlin. <laughs> well, this is now the second David Lynch film that I've seen. Mm-hmm. And I enjoyed this one a lot more. Really? Yeah, yeah, a lot more. Right. I-, I don't know why. Maybe because... Well, still being completely incomprehensible, it was a little bit more <laughs> comprehensible for me than Blue Velvet. <laughs> really? Did you, That's yeah. really Did you like weird. Be- <laughs> yeah. Did you like it more because it had Billy Ray Cyrus's epic mullet in it? <laughs> oh yes, of course. Anything with Billy Ray Cyrus, you know. That's why I love Hannah Montana so much. <laughs> <laughs> Does he still have a mullet? Uh, I, I hope so. I hope, I don't I remember. hope so. In his heart. Let me let me <laughs> check Yahoo News. You know, that could be a really good cowboy song. I've got a mullet in my heart. (laughs) (laughs) I think that metaphor is too deep for country songs. (laughs) Okay, I got a mullet on my truck. (laughs) (laughs) No, you've got little rubber testicles on your truck because you are an asshole. (laughs) (laughs) I got a mullet in my heart for America. (laughs) I got an eagle and a dog and some balls on my truck. I got a mullet for America in my heart. Oh. Beautiful. Hey. Bravo. <laughs> that was beautiful. Uh, uh, okay, so Caitlin, uh, I find it really, really surprising that you found this this easier to, to understand than than uh, Blue Velvet because Blue Velvet was a, a straight ahead story and. Well, I don't know. Maybe it's because I just didn't like the story so much. It was a bit too like gritty for me in Blue Velvet. Yeah. This one was like a mystery, and it just I don't like movies maybe that are necessarily straightforward, but there's just so many possibilities with this, and it's just fun to think about. Yeah. Brad, you had a good tweet about Mr. David Lynch mysteries I saw. Oh no, did I? Yeah, <laughs> you're like I think some like watching David Lynch films has taught me to never get involved with a mystery or something. Oh, like that. Nice. <laughs> uh, we'll get to more of that in a bit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, another Lynch thing, another Scooby Gang. Hmm. <laughs> what did you think of it, uh, Brad? <sighs> <laughs> I'm not a huge fan. I feel like if this had been a television show, I would be all about this television show. But, like, the added off, added stuff on the end to make it make sense, it feels like the European Twin Peaks pilot. That's what I thought. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I mean, yeah, it works, because he's made it work. Mm. But it's not, it's not some great, amazing, deep, well-thought-out thing. This is the interesting way he made this into a movie. <laughs> But it's not interesting of itself. Yeah. So do you guys think if it was a TV series, it, you know, none of the first part of the movie would have been a dream? Clearly not. I, yeah. I think it would have, but you wouldn't have known it was a dream, and maybe it would have been revealed eventually. You think? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or they would have done the whole thing. It would have been like the Who Killed Laura Palmer of the series, and that they... That was what it was, but they were never going to necessarily reveal it, and it would have spun off to explore the lives of some of the other characters more like they wanted to do in Twin Peaks so like you would have found out more about Adam and um and Joe the hitman who I love (laughs) (laughs) he's my favorite character um you know and then maybe you would have found it out eventually Mm -hmm. okay I am going to read one thing from mulholandrive.net which is just the newcomer's guide which is the classical interpretation Oh. Well, I think this is the real one. I'm sorry, I'm already cringing at any interpretations we're going to talk about of this movie. <laughs> okay, well, I'll, I'll read it and you tell me if it, if it makes sense to you or not. All right. Okay. Before I read this, I, I was giving the movie like a four, because I was like, what the fuck just happened? But then I read this and I was like, oh, I can kind of see that. <laughs> but All right. So, Diane Selwyn is a struggling actress in Hollywood. She moved to L.A. from Deep River, Ontario after winning a jitterbug competition that inspired her to become an actress. We descend into a pillow at the start of the film from Diane Selwyn's point of view. From now on until the moment we see her wake up in the bed, Diane is dreaming. She dreams that she's Betty, a fresh 
fresh-faced actress arriving in Hollywood. She dreams that Rita stumbles into her apartment after an accident, having lost her memory. She dreams that she wows the various assembled showbiz people at her audition. The dream climaxes with the haunting club silencio, the disappearance of Betty, and the opening of the blue cube back at Havenhurst. A knocking on the door awakens Diane from her bed, and she raises herself from her slumber to answer the door. The scenes that follow are intended to illustrate the breakdown of a relationship between Diane and Camilla, and subsequent mental collapse of Diane. Tricky thing is that Lynch presents them to us in a non-linear style. It's up to you to decide the chronological order of the scenes, but the crux of this interpretation is that it is inferred that Diane hires a hitman to kill Camilla. So from, from this point of view, the flashbacks can be seen as Diane's attempt to justify the murder in her mind and the dream as an attempt to relive and re reimagine Diane's life since her arrival in L.A. Do you not agree with that one, Evan? Uh, that's... <clears throat> okay, look. Um, I had to come up with an entire new like mental concept for just based on this movie uh which is that one thing left over that cannot that that defies your explanation mm. now that's a fine explanation but those old people came out of that bag at the end <laughs> <laughs> yeah i had to add yeah i took that explanation and then I, I watched the whole movie i'm like yeah it's making sense from this and then we got to the end with the old people in the bag, and I'm like, okay, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> I, so. I honestly think this is like one of the the films of like Lynch's that makes the most sense. Like the first time I saw it, I was kind of like, oh, okay, I, I think I kind of get what's going on. And then I watched it a second time, and I was like, oh, okay, cool. I still don't understand some of these other films, like <laughs> Lost Highway and In and Then, but I've not got a clue. Really? But this one, I, I'm like, you know, I, I kind of get what they where every single scene fits in on it and like that's claire because I, I i mean claire. i think that uh, go on <laughs> go on evan because evan's gonna kick my butt <laughs> now i'm just gonna say uh mm -hmm. old people in a bag <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's my concept old people in a bag they uh they thwart you just like they, life it's just because old people are evil so you know this is this is a fact and you see, the bag represents things that are hidden. <laughs> I don't know why they came out of the bag. I think it was just a creepy image with that bit. But I think when they're in the apartment, it's her, you know, she's trying She's trying to escape from what she's done. And that's in, you know, the scene where she's, uh, you know, um, <laughs> having a little bit of uh, action in her underpants. Um, the camera's like <laughs> focusing in and out on the like fireplace and it's like she's trying she's trying to focus everything out and she's trying to escape from it and obviously she can't and then at the end she's just kind of i think that's like her i don't know her parents or her grandparents or something and she's just thinking about them and the fact that she's killed someone and that's what makes her so, ultimately escape by killing herself so she hallucinated them you think and then yeah well, also I think so, um yeah. Yeah. Um, the uh, um, her neighbor has talked about um, the two detectives have been around the apartments asking about her. Yeah. Yeah. So I just assume the knocking on the door is actually the detectives, and she's yeah. realizing it's all coming to a head. So mm -hmm. she goes into crazy mode and then kills herself. Mm. Yes. Mm. The only other explanation for that would be that the crazy, the creepy guy behind the restaurant is actually some sort of supernatural guy who sends little little old people under the door and. <laughs> That's horrible. I'm going to dream about that tonight now. So it's it's whether or not you you believe this movie has anything supernatural in it. I guess is how you take the end. I guess so. Yeah. Mm. How did you take it, Caitlin? Yeah, I've kind of was thinking along the lines of what Claire was saying. Yeah, not too far from that. It's I don't know. I don't want to make this closed case, honestly, though, because I think there's like a lot of different like which part is actually sort of reality for me is still up for debate like not set in stone and it could be either way all right you want to say anything mel no no we didn't we didn't get you two's <laughs> yeah first impression oh you go ahead first well my first impression was what the fuck mm. yeah and then it's like i don't really like this movie <laughs> and then my my brain just doesn't work in abstracts very well <laughs> i need things to be straight ahead i'm too I don't know, I, I look for logic in everything too much, and I can't wrap my head, head around certain non-linear concepts sometimes, so I was really confused, and then I read that that synopsis, and then I watched it again with that in mind, that the whole first part is a dream, and I was like, okay, yeah, that makes sense, but yeah, then the old people in the bag at the end yeah. threw me, but then <laughs> us just talking now, yeah, maybe she's just crazy, and she's imagining the old people. I also thought maybe 
it's not a dream dream but it's like a dying dream like her brain is dying she shot herself and that's why some of the creepy things are in there so like the shot of the start where it hits the pillow isn't her falling asleep it's like her Death. falling on the pillow as she dies as she shoots herself that's yeah. quite cool hmm. i hadn't thought about that she was kind of hyperventilating when she before she fell on the pillow there so yeah yeah I couldn't wrap my head around the concept that this was a dream still, kind of, because have you guys ever had a dream where you're not in it? I haven't. <laughs> oh, all, wait, all my dreams are geometric <laughs> shapes floating around in magic what? on fire. Because <laughs> <laughs> Brad is a yeah. robot. This conversation. <laughs> you, you dream math? I, I basically dream screensavers. <laughs> 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 Always. Okay. So, like, so like the star, the, like when you're like flying in space and you see the stars kind of coming at you, that kind of thing? Mm- <laughs> no, it's just like shapes, like triangles and pyramids and spheres floating around. I've never had a dream where, like, I've had dreams with other people in them, but I'm always in the room. <laughs> there's, there's always... Have you guys had dreams of other people and you're not involved completely? Yeah. Have you really? Have you dreamed that you were a different person? Well, that's different. Oh, yeah. Cause that's, I, I yeah. dreamt I was Batman the other night. <laughs> <laughs> but but yeah, you're, still, you're still conscious inside a body. Like what? Uh, like what about the scenes that that she's not in? Like the the two people in the diner and talking about the creepy guy. Like, are you saying that she's imagining herself as one of those two guys? Or what I'm or saying just is that dis- David Lynch made a pilot for a TV show, <laughs> and then was forced to put a random ending on it mm-hmm. that he thinks makes sense enough, and other people think is really deep. Yeah, <laughs> I'm leaning that way. I I like that you um. You were all set to hate the movie, and then you turned to the internet, and now you feel better. <laughs> it's like, you know, speaking of Batman, it's like the movie squeezed and hammered you to the point of desperation, and in your desperation, you turned to a man you didn't fully understand. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> the internet is what, what I'm saying is the Joker. <laughs> Can I just say the best thing I found on the internet about Mulholland Drive mm-hmm. is someone trying to make the connection that the pool guy, played by Billy Ray Cyrus, <laughs> because his name is Gene and he's the pool guy, it's Gene Pool. So it's all about incest. What? <laughs> <laughs> what? Diane was raped by a, by a parental figure. Oh man. There's a and theory about is... abortion in there too. I'm gonna oh, I'm gonna read shut up internet. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna read the names of some of these theories. Yeah. We've got yeah the abortion theory. Uh, <laughs> Diane's suicide is not real. The old couple represent. What? At what? <laughs> Di- the old couple represent Adam and Camilla. Uh, replay of Diane's sexual abuse. Two drug trips. Uh, Diane was murdered. Um, <laughs> the bribery theory. <laughs> bribery. Th- I don't know what that one represents. No. Two dreams of a third person. Dream. <laughs> Oh, it's all happening in the cowboy's head. <laughs> Mo- Mobius strip, deal with the devil, a recorded sequence, Fa- fate and reincarnation, parallel universes. Rita and Betty are soul, soul wanderers. <laughs> oh, fuck. Ah. Sorry, you can I take get that any out. any of those. How I feel. <laughs> I just said I don't get any of those. No, uh, well, I mean, those are just the titles. You'd have to read them, but who has the time? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Are any of that indoctrination theory? Are you talking about the indoctrination theory from Mass Effect, or there's one for this? <laughs> yeah, I'm just saying. Yeah. Okay. What if it got into? What if it got into this too? <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> I don't even know what that is. It's the Reapers. <laughs> All right. Well, Mel, what did you think of it on first watch? Um, I was confused. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, you had some theories going before I mentioned what I had read. What I don't even remember, Matt. It was like, what, three weeks ago? No, yeah. I mean, just as we were watching it now. You were like, she's two different people. Or... I don't even remember what I was talking <laughs> you about. Were, you were right. I do not remember. I'd have to go through my notes. All right. Um, well, okay. Well, there's so much. It's such a mind fuck that it's yeah. just like, I don't know. Anyways, but the first time I watched it, I was like, okay, maybe I'm not supposed to understand what's going on. <laughs> you know, those things I don't know but then I don't know it just it does the way the movie was done doesn't really appeal to me that much yeah it's just I didn't like I didn't like I didn't like Diane slash Betty I didn't like Betty anyways because she was too Disney princess for me mm-hmm. and I know that she was supposed to be but I felt like every time she was in a scene she was gonna break out in song I just <laughs> did not like that <laughs> cartoon bird would true. land on her hand and yeah. That would have been amazing. <laughs> Squirrels would make her a dress. I think that's because, like, later on in a few episodes, 
when she goes to a really dark place, it would have been interesting. Mm -hmm. But the TV show never got made. Yeah, it would have been, but I don't know. It it was too too fake, you know. It wasn't real enough. Like, if she would have been... I just can't take fake acting, and I know that sounds kind of stupid to say that, but (laughs) I just can't. I can't deal with it. To me, it has to feel real. And it did just didn't feel it kind of rings false, so I just can't buy into it and I can't get into the movie mm. because of that. I don't know. That you was like Neil part- Cooper? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but he's delightful. She wasn't really delightful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I wasn't super into uh, Diane's part of this movie. <laughs> I know she's the main character, but I thought all the other side things were more were more uh, interesting, like uh the bumbling hitman and the, the guys in the diner who see the creep behind the restaurant, yeah. the cowboy, the director versus the mafia. All of that was way more interesting to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm going to read something here, though. For, uh, that uh, I found a quote from Mark Frost about Mulholland Drive. <laughs> it's from some interview. I don't know what. That's great sourcing, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> we can verify that. Okay. He may or may not have said this. <laughs> I found it on IMDb forums. Some guy named Luke says, Did you understand what David Lynch's Mulholland Drive was all about? Mark says, It started as a conversation David and I were having about a sequel to Twin Peaks. We wanted to take the Audrey Horn character, played by Cheryl, to Hollywood. I proposed Mulholland Drive, which I lived on as a title. He sold it as a pilot to ABC and then convinced the French that he, if he shot 45 more minutes, he could make something out of it. I haven't seen it. I heard it was a mess. I knew the pilot was a mess. David's strength and weak and weaknesses is that he is often able to transcend story because he's such a master created creating mood. His falling is that he's not a strong storyteller. He doesn't have a lot of interest in telling a story. He's not as interested in character as fragments of personality. He's a surrealist. I think that's fair. Somewhat fair, somewhat bitter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a bit bitter, but I've been the bit about he's more interested in fragments of personality, I think. Yeah, I, I don't have a source for that, so may may not have even said that. <laughs> but that's one opinion that I think holds true about David Lynch, is that he's not about the story so much. Well, that's why all these theories are just kind of, I don't know, they just irritate me so much. It's like, and I kind of realized this last night when I was re-watching the movie and drinking heavily, those two might be connected. <laughs> but um, it, it's just like, because, I mean, I... I I was looking up various things just for just for giggles to see what the internet had done with them, like that you know French decorating book before they put the wig on her. It's like, <laughs> what? And it's and it's blue, so it's an object of change. It was like, no, okay, you can't. Like this movie is not even really, in in my opinion, about understanding it. I think it's just how you feel while you're watching. Mm-hmm. Like I don't really think in the end that it means anything. I think it's just some some stuff. It's just a bunch of things. It's a bunch of things that happen. Yeah. yeah. Right. And and trying to analyze it, like some of the things in there, like it's a very closed ecosystem. This movie, mm-hmm. and some things point to other things, but they don't necessarily have to add up to something. And it's like I just kept thinking, you know people on the internet who have to make this make sense like has anybody read bartleby the scribner no 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 literary i mean it's it's dull as hell but uh (laughs) it's basically about a guy who is a scribner obviously and suddenly one day decides he doesn't want to work anymore he still shows up to work, but he doesn't work. And the, <laughs> the story is about the boss trying to get him to work and trying to figure out why he would be the way he is. And in the end, there's really no explanation. Uh, and I kind of think that that's how Mulholland Drive works. And it's kind of a trap to get people to try to figure it out while, you know, Herman Melville or David Lynch laugh at them. <laughs> yeah. Or or I laugh at them, which I do. People watch this movie like super neurotic people. Like this has to mean something. Like it's like Vinci code or something. <laughs> well, like Jerry Seinfeld, basically. Okay, now which which word did they emphasize in that sentence? Because they all mean something different. And if I can figure that out, then I've just cracked this mystery and then I I'm one step closer to understanding life. But, I mean, Mm. you present a mystery to somebody, of course they're going to try to solve it. I mean, it's just human nature. But, I mean, 
But there's no how mystery. Ne- how neurotic you are about it, I guess, is up to you. But <laughs> I mean, I do live my life that way. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. I, I don't recommend it. <laughs> but, I mean, I watch this movie and sometimes I laugh and sometimes I'm confused. And But I don't really need to sum it all up into meaning something because it really doesn't because god damn it those old people came out of that bag <laughs> those old people came out of that bag independently of of diane like across town they came out of that bag the, the creepy guy sent them you know what though it's kind of funny though because i don't know why i feel this way but i feel like i should like this movie because it doesn't mean anything because well, everyone says normal. it's great because everybody says uh. well i guess because everybody says it's great but <laughs> hello <Sorry. Sorry. laughs> But it, I, guess I really I like people that. are so obsessed with deconstructing it yeah. because they think there is something to understand. Yeah. Because people want to think they're smart and they think <laughs> if there's something that's hard to understand and they work to understand that they're doing something. Mm-hmm. But they're not. Yeah. <laughs> that makes me yep. that makes me really happy what you said, Evan. I'm perfectly <laughs> happy, yeah, that this is just like that there has there isn't something to deconstruct really, but it's yeah, very abstract and it's something I really ad- like because you know, I don't know, even in this world where there's so much science, and that's what I have to do for my job every day, there's stuff that, you know, just, like, you don't have to, like, understand and like, just sort of, you know, feel it. Mm. It's funny, though, because I felt the exact same way when I first watched it. I was like, yeah, I don't think I'm supposed to understand this. I think it's just a story, and that's how it is. But I didn't really like it that much. <laughs> Versus you guys, like, you guys really liked it, but I, I don't know. Just- well, I... I like it in a different way from the people on the internet who are competing over who can come up with the most <laughs> elaborate yeah, theory. Yeah, yeah. Like, but they're missing the point that that scene with the hitman is just hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it really is. Yeah. Is it ever? I read one article that said that, you know, in that scene, David Lynch out Tarantino's Tarantino, and I agree with that. <laughs> I love Mark Pellegrino. He's like he's a great actor. I think that scene was a prequel to Lost. <laughs> <laughs> he's getting he's getting that black book, and it's got a name of all the people that are going to be sent to the island in it. Claire, you had a uh, you had something you wanted to bring up, right? There was um, David Lynch released um, ten. Uh, I don't know if he released them in the DVD or you know when it was released, but like a, ten yeah. clues. To understanding the film mm-hmm. and i mean some of them are really vague i did have them up on my laptop let me see if i still have them oh yeah yeah I st- oh yeah i do that. i do do you want me to read them yeah sure okay okay so david lynch's 10 clues to unlocking this thriller <laughs> <sighs> yes yeah. so the first one is pay p- particular attention in the beginning of the film at least two clues are revealed before the credits notice number two notice the appearances of the red lampshade number three <laughs> Can you hear the title of the film that Adam Kesha is auditioning actresses for? Is it mentioned again? Uh, number four. An accident is a terrible event. Notice the location of the accident. Number five. Who gives a key and why? Number six. Notice the robe, the ashtray, the coffee cup. Number seven. What is felt, realized, and gathered at the Club Silencio? <laughs> <laughs> number eight. Did talent alone help Camilla? Number nine, notice the occurrences surrounding the man behind Winkies. And number ten, where is Aunt Ruth? <laughs> These sound like comprehension questions that you'd see at the end of a book for, like, elementary school kids. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> but honestly, they also sound like complete BS to me. Yeah. yeah. Is that it him just fucking like from... with people? I, I think so. Yeah. yeah. It I sounds mean, uh... from that like he's saying there is something to kind of understand, but it sounds like it's... No, you know, I, it's, I think it's, it, it's explaining it's, the it's, obvious. It's, yeah, exactly. It's like nothing mm-hmm. like going, there's two clues before the credit. It's like, well, it, it just seems silly because like, like when I said when I watched the film, I just think to me, it, it like makes sense. It wasn't really about unlocking it at all. I was just like, this film makes sense, you know, to me. But it's not like it's a huge mystery because I just felt like it was very obvious. But that's not saying I'm correct. You know, in if there is like what's going on in it, it just means that I just went, oh okay, you know. To, and to me, it's like, oh, it's about this, mm-hmm. which I didn't explain very well then, but you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah. Evan well, is far more articulate than I am. <laughs> well, I mean, here's here's the most telling part of that list is in point number one. At mm-hmm. least two clues are revealed before the credits. David Lynch, you don't even know how many clues you put in <laughs> before the. 
<laughs> at least. <laughs> like, everybody will pick out two different clues that they think are the two clues, but number 11 is just walls, nerds. <laughs> <laughs> so is there anything in here that you guys were confused about that you feel the need to talk over with, with the group? <laughs> I will. Um, I, lo- I will. I just want to say that I love that Michael J. Anderson is a Krang. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> did you read about how what they did with him? Yes. No. It's so weird. They they put prosthetics on him, right, to make him look like he's a a guy who's got a regular proportioned body, but just a a small head. Or <laughs> you, if you'll he's got notice, that little model hand that never moves. Yeah, he never moves. It's weird. Hmm. Why is he encased in glass? <laughs> 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 Why is I like anything? John Waters, Tash. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I'm just really interested to see where some of these things would have went if the series went ahead, because I don't think it would have turned out to be a dream, and I think these would have been real characters that really fleshed out and had backgrounds, and I would be really interested in them. Like, well, yeah, because there's so much setup because we've got this like mob stuff going on. We've got the the movie thing. Yeah, I mean, I think it's pretty clear that Betty w- that um. Uh, the director would have eventually cast Betty as the lead in the movie, and all hell would break loose with the mafia people. Yeah. That's clearly where it was going. Mm-hmm. I want this to be a TV show, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been aw- awesome if it was a Twin Peaks spinoff and it was Audrey in the lead. <laughs> mm. I mean, if it was Audrey in the lead, I don't think it would have ended how it did. I don't think he would have had Audrey Horn blowing her brains out in a, no. a room after murdering I mean, her I mean, lesbian I mean, lover. I mean, you if... Know. If it went to series, I don't think she would have blown her brains out anyways. No. But uh, there was a bunch of stuff that could, uh, I wrote beside it uh, could have been pilot leftovers, like the cops investigating. They You never see them again. And um, Particularly as one's Robert Forster, it's like such a tiny role for him. I think he would have definitely been back. Yeah, and the two guys in Winkies, like, what, <laughs> why, and who are they? Like, I assumed they were cops, but that's never confirmed, and... It, you know what's funny? The first time I watched this, um, I thought he was interviewing for a job there. <laughs> <laughs> because he starts off, why this Winkies? Why here? <laughs> why do you have to work at this Winkies? Well, there's this Winkies. <laughs> that's, that's I so thought the one guy was a mental patient and the other one was kind of like a therapist. Yeah. yeah. Kara. We all had different yeah. interpretations of who these guys were. Yeah. Well, and that's another thing. I feel like um, that would have been something because he says um, there's a. It, it seems like he's had prophetic dreams before from the way the scene works. Because mm. mm. the guy would have been so like, good in a TV show, damn it! Because yeah. mm. the guy was like, "Oh, here we go again." Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then there's the hitman. You know, he would have been character would have been fleshed out. Best suit. scene of the entire film. Yes. I love it, Joe. <laughs> it was hilarious. Yeah, it was awesome. I love him. <laughs> and did you guys notice that Hitman Joe in that? I don't even know if his name's Joe. I just call him Hitman Joe for that, some reason. That's his name in the credits, yeah. Oh, that's good. Um, I knew like it, for some reason that was in my head. Um, but in the in that scene where he kills the guy and then you know he shoots the woman accidentally in the other room, he's got um, different coloured eyes. Who knows? Like he's got wearing two different um, contact lenses. Like one's really? really dark, one's really pale. Yeah, like kind of David Bowie eyes. Yeah. But then later in the film. When he's sitting with Diane and he gives her the key, he's got normal eyes. Huh. Weird. What I'm not that? saying that means anything. <laughs> it means kind of weird. <laughs> Tell us what it means. <laughs> I don't know. I can't go on until I know. <laughs> so <laughs> deep. <laughs> Was one of his eyes blue? Because then it is a, an object of change. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, sorry, um, guys. I've just come across another great theory. Oh. Um, I don't know if you knew this, but um, in actuality, the uh, prostitute... Um, she's the protagonist of the film. What? <laughs> yes. Oh. The, the one with the nipples. Yes, <laughs> yes uh-huh. the one that's Penny from Showgirls. <laughs> and also Showgirls sure. 2. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> no, it makes perfect sense. It makes, it makes like, so much sense that it is nonsense. <laughs> yes. I thought the protagonist was the uh, Mexican janitor who got shot. Oh, yeah. I think, no, you're close. It was actually the vacuum. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> Why did he shoot the vacuum? I, st- I, what? <laughs> I don't know. He looks... Why are you shooting the vacuum? Because then... he could. Because <laughs> he yeah, had a gun well, and he felt like... He looked very pleased with himself. <laughs> yeah. Well, until the alarm started going off and then he was like, oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's your answer because it's funny. Mm. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so, if he just gone over and turned it off, that's not funny. No. That's not... Inept hitman Joe. Yeah. 
<laughs> what do you think that? What do you think, man, Joe? <laughs> He's got to be true to himself, Claire. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think that key was for? Like the second blue key, the one that wasn't the triangle that she got in the real world. Do you mean what was it? What? What do you mean? The blue key when she's like, "What's this key open?" and he, Joe just laughs at her. I'm glad you mentioned that. Okay. That key doesn't open a goddamn thing. <laughs> That's why he's laughing. <laughs> That's why he's laughing, because, yeah. uh, well, okay, show someone a key, and they will ask what it opens. Mm. That is everything you need to know about Mulholland Drive. Uh-huh. That is the entire internet discussion on this movie. Evan. Also, also, so uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> also, uh, when David Lynch made the first part, there was a pilot for a TV show, there was a blue key, <laughs> and he had to make up an explanation for how the, what that meant. <laughs> Uh, but in his explanation, I think he should have at least told us what it opened. No. I figured he was just laughing because he was like, she says, what does it open? And it doesn't matter what it opens <laughs> because what it's kind of, oh, I'm going to sound so pretentious saying this, and I don't mean to be, <laughs> but what it's kind of, the important thing is that when she sees the blue key again, that will mean that she has had her ex-lover murdered. Uh, so it's kind of what does that open? It opens the fact that she's a murderer, uh, that she's actually had her. Do you know what I mean? It's that. that yeah, part, that's what I just took it as. It doesn't matter what it physically opens because you're, you're and that's not. why he was laughing. It's a. Uh, it's her receipt, basically. Yeah, she, yeah exactly. She probably just dropped it in her mailbox when the deal was done. Yeah. Well, you know what's you know what's great is that that's so Hitman Joe because they he probably does that all the time. So if they if they ever caught him they would be able to pin him to every blue key. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the blue key murders. I have like to imagine there's a whole system. Like, yellow key means, ah, didn't work out so well. <laughs> <laughs> Green key, um, I maimed her. <laughs> Purple key, she may be on her way back here to murder you. <laughs> he took red keys to, One of them to, just like, means run. <laughs> he took red keys to the uh, vacuuming guy's family. That's his my bad key. <laughs> <laughs> Whoopsie daisies. <laughs> what are uh, what are some of your favorite scenes? I know we know Claire's. Mine and is the man mine. behind wing keys and Hitman Joe. They're my two yeah, favorites. Yes. It's just weird though that some some freaky otherworldly hobo would be hiding behind a winkies waiting to scare somebody shitless. <laughs> yeah. It's just <laughs> Oh, How creepy. By the way, guys, when I go to LA next month, I'm so going to go and jump out from behind that corner. <laughs> <laughs> behind a corner? Because I, I know behind where it is. Nah. <laughs> I'm so going to dress up as that person and just wait oh. and jump out at someone. <laughs> oh, that was creepy. <laughs> the other thing about him like jumping out is like, if, you, if you're afraid that there's going to be a guy back there, why don't you take a wide angle? Don't go straight right to the corner so he can jump at you. Yes. Yeah. Always take a wide angle. <laughs> they never do, though. <laughs> But I guess he didn't expect it, you know. You don't yes, expect he did. you don't expect your, you <laughs> he did ex- nothing but expect it. You don't expect your dreams to really pop out at you. <laughs> he did. I don't know, he was looked pretty freaked out there the whole time. Mm. One of my my favorite was the uh, the cowboy scene. I love that. <laughs> yeah. That's a, just another cool David Lynch character. Yeah. And uh Battle of Menti with the, oh, uh, the espresso. with the espresso. I love it. That was great. Too. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I like how when he spits out the espresso, the first thing the guy says is, that espresso is good. <laughs> I came highly right. You are wrong for not liking that espresso. Taking for food. About the uh, cowboy, I have a note here. Um, this is just on the trivia section of IMDb, so who knows if it's real. Uh <laughs> <clears throat> but the cowboy said, "You'll uh, if you do good, you'll see me one more time. If you if you do bad, you'll see me two more times." Yeah. Here's what it says: Justin Thoreau said in an interview that since he didn't have the entire script but received the pages day by day, he asked David Lynch if the cowboy would appear again in the film. According to him, Lynch's answer was, "I don't know. We will find out together." <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. He does, in fact, turn up two more times, but yeah, but the, the director, Diane. the director didn't see him. No, he was busy. No, laughing. Diane saw him, which means she did bad. bad <laughs> there you go. It all means something. It's not. <laughs> David Lynch was not making it up as he went. Cowboy, I think by the he way, made it up as he went. Like the cowboy was going to appear at that party, and then David Lynch was like, "Shit, I have to." Oh, sorry, <laughs> I have to have him appear another time. So they just put in that weird little scene of him going time to wake up beautiful or whatever just so he could have appeared but yeah i think it was making it up as he went along man i would have put the cowboy in as much as i possibly could yeah me too yeah, no, i just I had just... him in the background of all scenes and it was like spot the cowboy <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> like, where's Waldo? <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sad for the series that could have been. Mm. Yes. Mm-hmm. What did you like, Caitlin? Uh, I also liked the Hitman scene. It was way up there. I thought the Club Silencio uh, scene was mm. pretty cool. Oh, yeah. That was cool, yeah. What did you make of her shakes and stuff? And the, Who's the blue lady? <laughs> <laughs> it seemed this was one of the parts that seemed like it almost as if it was supposed to be supernatural. Yeah. So maybe it was the red curtains, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I did like how how the guy like prefaced up front. He's like, everything is a recording. It's all an illusion. And they're like, okay, go whatever. And then he goes away. And then somebody comes out and starts singing. They're all into it. And then. She falls down and it's a recording and they're all surprised. Aha, you forgot. But it was so convincing. <laughs> I, even I was convinced that she was, well, she might have been really singing, but I mean, mm. yeah. you know. How beautiful was that version of um, Cry? So beautiful. Really it nice. was. Yeah. It, Another Roy Orbison song. Yeah. In my c- I have a bit of random Roy Orbison trivia I was going to send you for your <laughs> Blue Velvet one. Can I say it now? Sure. I, I no. watched this thing. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up, you. Uh, I watched this thing. Um, about Roy Orbison because I love Roy Orbison and they were saying that um, Bono who I hate ugh, um, Bono and had been watching Blue Velvet and really really liked the film and after watching it wrote the song um, She's a Mystery Girl or She's a Mystery I can't remember which, what it's called and that was kind of his one that was um, influenced by Blue Velvet oh. and tried to sing it himself um, and you know, and someone I, I don't know who it was, like a bandmate or his girlfriend or whatever, said, "No, you have to get Roy Orbison to sing it." And apparently, there was all these weird coincidences that happened that ended up with Roy Orbison actually singing it. <laughs> and weirdly, it's my favourite Roy Orbison song. And frustratingly, it was written by Bono. <laughs> 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 but I love that song. So it was it was actually influenced by Blue Velvet. Hmm. So. About the blue lady, who who's the blue lady? <laughs> Look, you're you're just falling into the trap, man. <laughs> but we need to talk about something. <laughs> I thought it was Guy Pierce wearing his drag outfit from. <laughs> <laughs> was her dress made of American Express gold cards? Yeah. <laughs> It's kind of hard to discuss the film when you just conclude that eh, it doesn't matter. <laughs> well, look, okay, I read a theory that the first part is because it's a dream, and the second part is because she's crazy. And it's like, congratulations, you've made the movie completely subjective, and there's no point in you ever watching it. Mm. <laughs> but, like, I don't know, the the why was the man from another place a little person? Because it's weird. Mm. Yeah. And it puts you off balance. And the blue lady is weird. And she's blue, so she is an object of change. <laughs> <laughs> it was just the kind of, like, weird look that, like, um, Lil, Lil the um, the dancer in the Fire Walk With Me film had. It was just that kind of weird sort of, I don't know, it, it reminded me of her. And I think, it, like Evan said, it was just to be weird. Just to have something weird there. And it's visually, it's like, it looks cool, you know. And he's, yeah. he loves his visuals, so... You know, who knows? I, I just thought the whole Club Silencio thing was like it was a dream and it was her waking up and she's being told none of this is real, this is all a dream. And that's why they start crying because they know that she's going to wake up and her and, um, what's her name, Rita, that's not real. And she's starting to realise what she did. Hmm. But again, it wasn't like over-examining it. It was just like, oh, okay, well, that's what's happening. You know, once I'd seen it once, I was like, oh, okay, that's what that was. What did you guys think of Naomi Watts in this? Was this her breakout role? role or I think so. Uh, I think in so, this, yeah. in, uh, in North America, at least? Well, obviously her breakout role was Tank Girl. Come on. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we know what uh, Laura Herring... Um, or Herring uh, we know her breakout role, of course, was obviously playing uh, um, Angie Harmon's sister in an episode of Baywatch <laughs> Nights. <laughs> really? Uh, <laughs> clearly. The episode Thin Blood, Season 1, Episode 12... <laughs> you have watched i haven't watched it yet oh okay you'll get there <laughs> i'll get there wait, but you can't wait mm. <laughs> she was show. super foxy in this film i just have to say mm. naomi watts not so much but she was super super foxy <laughs> uh i was so uh I was are we so... recording an episode of ramjack now <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> i was so taken aback when uh when she's like, you don't have to sleep on that couch, just get in bed. Like, inv- invitation to bed does not mean 
does not equal naked invitation to bed, so I was just like, <laughs> yes, <Yeah>. it does. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Naked sleepovers like that, unless you, you know, unless you're like a swinger or something. <laughs> that's that's the one thing after I read the dream theory that, that I was like, oh yeah, that's a dream. That doesn't happen in real life. No. That's just <laughs> wishful thinking. Yeah. <laughs> that's because you're a married man, Matt. No, I mean wishful thinking, thinking on her part, because she loved that. Oh, she wanted her to get in her bed naked. I mean, you barely know the person, and they get naked in bed with you. Mm. And then and then you start making out, and then you tell them, I'm in love with you. No, not I don't think so. <laughs> that doesn't really happen. <laughs> She's in love with the mystery. <laughs> She's not in love Wait a minute. Are you saying this movie is not a documentary? Sometimes Mulholland Days turn into Mulholland Nights. <laughs> Things get a little crazy. Sometimes there's a werewolf. Sometimes. Okay, here's how you know that this is a David Lynch film. Okay. <laughs> When uh, when uh, Betty goes for the auditions and she gets a chance to meet with a hotshot director, but she's like, "Oh no, I gotta go solve some mysteries instead." <laughs> <laughs> she's an early Donna Haywood, or she's a oh. later Donna Haywood. <laughs> Career before mysteries, people. <laughs> Always. What kind of a movie were they making? Was it like a biopic or something, or what? It was so weird because that's such a weird audition. It's like, oh, you're gonna audition for our film. You don't even have to be out to sing. Just go over there and lip sync. Yeah, but sell it. I don't know. Were it's the, more lip syncing. Were the two songs by different artists? I think so. Oh, yeah. So it couldn't be a biopic of one like '50 singer. <laughs> Wasn't it the Sylvia, it was North, Sylvia North? Sylvia North. Yeah. Who was that? No one. It was not, not a real person. Okay. <laughs> okay. There's a there's a really cool mix of the song that Melissa George um, uh, was lip syncing to on the Mashed in Plastic album, the David Lynch like mashup album, and it's mixed with the Smashing Pumpkins. Oh, cool. It's really cool. So whenever I hear her singing it in the film, I'm like singing Smashing Pumpkins in the background. Did you ever look up uh, Billy Corgan's Twitter? No. Oh, he's an insane conspiracy theorist. He's like... Awesome! He's talking about chemtrails and stuff. Oh. Yeah. Right, I'm going to follow him right now. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, I have to give a shout out to Anne Miller because she's awesome. Oh, yeah. I love her in this. She's great. She the uh, landlady. Yeah, she yeah. she used to. Evan might be able to confirm this for me, but wasn't she? She had the world record for fastest tap dance. What? Like really? right up until the eighties, I think. Like yeah, because she's she's amazing. She did a lot of musicals with Fred Astaire and like in those days, and she was very famous for. Uh, her tap dancing and her legs I think were insured for like a million dollars or something crazy in those days it was like a ridiculous amount yeah I'll post a video up on the the group of her in one in Easter Parade because she's awesome in that All right. oh oh okay yes <laughs> I love that yeah. movie <laughs> yeah well, it's just really good I mean I loved Coco because she was just like old Hollywood mm. Mm. yeah like she delivered her lines like I thought like a honest. movie from the <laughs> well, it was like the way that she delivers her lines is very like '30s movie. Yeah. Mm, mm-hmm. Like I can't recreate it, but you know it when you hear it. Yeah. 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 I don't know. I just like instantly liked her. Uh, one thing, kind of the flip side of that, the audition scene. I skipped it last <laughs> night because it is mm-hmm. the most awkward thing. <laughs> yeah, I, I hate that scene. I re- it's I awful. Re- the old guy. Creepy old guy. Yeah, it's uh, really creepy. I'm just. I'm gonna play this nice and close. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and, the, and the director for that movie specifically was like the worst director of life. Seriously, <laughs> yeah. like gives no direction or no clear direction as to what she should be doing. It felt it felt pretty real to me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm not gonna say oh, I haven't but... seen sing similar auditions. <laughs> mm. yeah. For those people who watched Carnival, when the old woman appeared at the door, oh, did you go, Apollonia? Can I just... <laughs> <laughs> I'm just thinking about all those creepy faces, like the creepy hobo and the creepy decomposing face. Blah. Mm. <laughs> Good makeup. Nightmares, <laughs> yes. There's always like well, the a... hobo's makeup wasn't that great. It just looked like he had charcoal all over there his face. Always, there's always a nightmarish character, though, in every friggin' movie. It's mm. just... Oh. Do you think the man behind Winkies and Bob hang out in their spare time? Yes. For sure. <laughs> Death row. How can they not? They compare notes. Oh, Death Bag. <laughs> <laughs> it has old people in it. <laughs> <laughs> the the near dead. Do you think the man behind Winkies was like, hey, Bob, can I borrow your death bag? <laughs> <laughs> I think that they all have their own different, like, their special death bags. It's like their lightsabers. <laughs> oh, that's cool. Yeah, because he's a hobo, so he would have, like, a... 
uh, crappy paper bag, whereas Bob's probably got like a denim bag. That's <laughs> full, it's full of owls. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Little owls. <laughs> what would Mark Pellegrino's death bag look like? <laughs> It's full of keys and it weighs 30 pounds. <laughs> I love Mark Pellegrino. Yeah, me too. He's so... <laughs> I've only seen him in this, uh, Dexter, where he played Paul. And, mm. and you uh, know he's going to be in Lost, but we haven't seen oh, that Oh yeah, I haven't yet. seen that part in Lost. Yeah. He's great in Supernatural as well, he plays Lucifer. Oh, okay. Mm. He's, really, he's really funny. <laughs> He was also in The Big Lebowski as a like another hitman type character, I think. He was also in a film that gave me that I only saw a few scenes from, and I actually had nightmares about it because he was a guy who who was dressed as a clown. Uh. I think it was called Saving Alan, which is scary enough. He was dressed as a clown, and these people found him his dead body as a clown, and they put him on like a little Viking like boat thing and pushed him out the seat and set it on fire and then he wasn't dead so he stood up on the raft and it was a clown on fire screaming oh, no. and, ah! I had so many nightmares oh, <laughs> me. every so often still my friend will tweet me and just just tweet me clown fire <laughs> wow it was on fire so it's an object of change <laughs> cool um, okay, update. What? Mark Pellegrino unfortunately hasn't been on Baywatch Nights, Aww. but he was in Night Rider 2010. Awesome. Yay! Oh man. <laughs> oh, I have a I have a, a note like a bit of trivia, but I don't think it's on IMDb or anything. But I remember hearing it at the start when Rita gets out of the car and she's all dazed and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I think David Lynch told her his direction to her was to for her to act like a broken ceramic doll. No, they you know, don't. like and ceramic I, dolls don't yeah. act. <laughs> <laughs> he used the exact same um, uh, directing reference for a late, another one of his later movies, but I won't say which one. I know, I know what you're talking about. Oh, and also my other note is when the guy leaves the diner to go behind Winkies, he leaves so much bacon on his plate, and that's just no. ridiculous. And it looks like he didn't eat anything. He left everything. He had like a full yeah, glass of orange. I didn't care about the eggs, the bacon. You don't leave bacon. <laughs> I was worried about the orange juice too. Orange juice and bacon is like a breakfast for me. You uh, should have brought it to the hobo at back. I know. As a peace offering, please stay out of my dreams. <laughs> 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 All right, so quotes. Yay. All right, I'm gonna go first because I don't have barely any. I've got two, I think. The the very first line, I think maybe one of the very first lines by Adam. Uh, he used this weird voice, and he's he's just like. What's the photo for? <laughs> <laughs> I just like I just like that. But read. he was more like who what? <laughs> What's the photo for? Yeah, was <laughs> Justin Thoreau is great in this movie. I've never what? heard of him. And I oh. heard about him recently. Yeah, and then, I, engaged and then I watched. Edition. Yeah, and then I watched this movie, and then like the next day on IMDb, it's like Justin Thoreau engaged or engaged to Jennifer Aniston. Like, Matt, if you watch Six Feet Under, you would know who he is. Oh, okay. I know. He was Speaking in, of Six uh, Feet Under, um, you realize this is another movie where a Canadian girl comes to California and lets a stranger yeah. live in her apartment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're too trusting. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, Justin Thoreau was in American Psycho. Oh. Yeah. As one of the cronies. He's in but, um, or... Land Empire as well. Okay. Yeah, but never mind that. They've literally uh, liked... Yeah, we, we, yeah, we're not going to do that. And this he's really good in the Baxter. Yes. Yeah. He yeah. reminded me of his look. Reminded me of Johnny Knoxville in this. This <laughs> like, era, I guess. Hips the sheet. Yeah. All right. Somebody else got a quote. I've got one. This is from uh, Miley's dad. <laughs> <laughs> that ain't no way to treat your wife, buddy. I don't care what she's done. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't, so awful. isn't that the worst to be like you should be able to be kicked out of your own house like I'm pretty sure he's the big director and that's his house and they kick him out <laughs> that, that was a pretty creative way though of him to like uh, get revenge on his wife to put pink yeah. paint all over the yeah. jewelry there <laughs> and he did it like in a trance like state yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I really like the uh, I don't know if that was a hitman who came there later that punched out his wife I like that part Adam <laughs> Kesha Adam Kesha. <laughs> <laughs> I have one from uh, Miley Cyrus's dad as well, which is just forget you ever saw it. It's better that way. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Those are his two lines. <laughs> <laughs> no, he also has the line where um, she's yelling at Adam, and then he goes, 
He's probably upset, Lorraine. <laughs> <laughs> He's quite understanding. Do a do a cowboy line. Do you have any of those? <laughs> do I have a cowboy line? Uh, I do. Uh, where is it? Oh no. Uh, hang on, hang on, hang on. <laughs> Man, daddy, you go some way. The way his life may be. <laughs> <laughs> Got a little Morgan Freeman there. <laughs> now, did you say that because you agree? <laughs> <laughs> no, you're not listening. <laughs> what if you're busy being a smart aleck to be thinking? <laughs> now, I want you to think and stop being a smart aleck. Can you try that for me? <laughs> Did he remind anyone what else of uh, William Sadler? Yes. Who's yeah. William Sadler? Oh, I okay. really thought he was played by William Sadler for, for ages, because he, he really looks like him. William Sadler has been in too many things for me to pick just one. He was, he was the bad guy in Die Hard 2. He was the Grim Reaper in Bill and Ted's Bogus <laughs> Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> yes. I, I, know that, I know that guy, but I've never, I, don't, I don't know if I've seen him without makeup. I have another quote from Hitman Joe. Um, <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> And then I love the way he goes, hey man. Pew! <laughs> <laughs> you guys ever heard a silence pistol in real life that's not a movie one? Yeah, it's really <laughs> loud. <actually>. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not silent. No. <laughs> Who else didn't go? Caitlin. Me, yes. I also had one from Hitman. <laughs> hey man, hey, she's hurt real bad. Hey, can you come here and call the phone? I need you. She's hurt real bad, man. I'm serious. You gotta come here and call the hospital. Hey, I'm serious. I can't do everything myself, man. <laughs> Desperation. Yes. <laughs> I love when she's like, something bit me bad. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Did you go, Mel? No. Um. Napkin. What? Napkin. <laughs> <laughs> that was a great scene. I couldn't figure out when his partner or his brother or whatever, when he stands up and yells, what did he yell? I don't know. It doesn't matter. Okay. <laughs> Just like the rest of this movie. Are there's we... your there's <laughs> search the internet and people are sure that whatever Dan Hedea yells in this movie is the key to everything. <laughs> oh, did any of you guys watch this on D V D? Yes. Yeah. Because you did. Did you know it's on the DVD? I don't know if it's on yours, but I, I think it's on pretty much all of them. There are no uh, chapter breaks. Oh, really? Is is that just because it's a bare bones DVD? No, it's because um, David Lynch wanted to like said that it should only be viewed like the whole thing, so there's no chapter break. So okay. if you want to skip through, you have to like literally fast forward through the whole film. And it's like on my DVD version as well of Fire Walk with Me. There are chapter breaks, but some of them are literally thirty seconds. <laughs> some of them are 30 seconds, some of them are 25 minutes. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And certainly a person who would do that is incapable of just making a movie that is for just trolling the internet. Mm. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> no, mine didn't have chapter breaks, but I, like, it was like a screener, so I thought that was why, but if it's... No, nope, mine does not either. Huh. Any interesting special features? No. No? No. There's just nothing on it, or they're not... There's the trailer, and there's cast and filmmakers, which is always great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of those awful... I think this one's on Blu-ray, though, now, isn't it, I think? Uh, I don't know. I don't Mm, think so. Oh, we should say as well that they did a Club Silencio. David Lynch helped open it in Paris. So there is a real Club Silencio. But sadly, it looks looks nothing like the one in the film. No. But it's kind of... He designed, like, some of the furnishings and things so it's pretty cool looking but yeah it'd be cooler looking if it looked like the picture in the film there was a blue haired person wandering around mm. that's pretty cool um I, I have a quote i didn't do any quotes oh, okay well basically everything the cowboy says but if i had to pick <laughs> one thing out there's sometimes a buggy how many drivers does a buggy have <laughs> Like what? There's sometimes. There's not always a buggy. Right? <laughs> sometimes, the buggy. sometimes the planets align, and all the blue <laughs> things are in the same place <laughs> with the tides, which are also blue because they are objects of change. <laughs> and when that happens, there's a buggy. <laughs> sometimes I have eyebrows. Sometimes I don't. <laughs> sometimes my arms bend back. <laughs> you should have said that. That would have been so cool. Sometimes yeah. my arms bend back. It's like, oh, I don't want to think about you doing creepy sex acts with Liam and Shaq. <laughs> Some days, cowboy days turn into cowboy nights. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. 
<laughs> ooh, ooh, can I end the quote? Quotes with uh, with something? Okay. Silencio. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. So ratings, I guess. Who would like to go first? Who's got the lowest rating? Who who, who guesses there? Me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I think it's better than middling average. Okay. <laughs> but I I definitely don't enjoy it as much as Blue Velvet or anything really. It's 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 okay, but it's just it's shoddy in the fact that it's clearly just forty five minutes tapped on to finish the thing. So I think I gotta go oh crap, I've already lost my thing. Six and a half out of ten, Michael J. Anderson Krangs. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, that would have been awesome if Michael J. Anderson's head was in the stomach of that thing. <laughs> <laughs> and he went, Shredder. <laughs> you will get this girl in my movie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm not much better than that. I got 7 out of 10. Uh, 7 out of 10 wasted, interesting character concepts. <laughs> because of all the characters that I really enjoyed that went nowhere. Besides the main characters, but yeah, everyone's gonna hate me on the internet because everyone loves this movie. <laughs> Go ahead. The internet's wrong. Man, I'm sorry, Brad, but I, I went six. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> congratulations! <laughs> yeah, <laughs> six newly painted pink jewelries. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Maybe it'll grow on us and at on with time. With time, I don't know. Like I just I, didn't enjoy it as much as any of. <laughs> Fire Walk With Me I really didn't enjoy mm. first. Mm. Yeah. Fire Walk With Me I enjoyed more like I hated the first time and I definitely enjoy it more over time yeah. and I think that's been most of the case with a lot of Lynch's films um, apart from The Empire which I've seen one and a half times because I couldn't sit through it a second time yeah. I think I honestly maybe enjoyed me. I didn't even enjoy Dune that much but I think maybe I enjoyed Dune a bit better than wow. this movie that's kind of sad <laughs> to say huh. it's kind of sad to say I know but it and I really didn't even, like I said, enjoy it that much. I definitely like uh, Wild at Heart and yeah. uh, Lost Highway better than this. Yeah, and, I do too. And those aren't considered better by, no. by the majority. Yeah. Um, I gave it quite a high rating just because I do, I do really like this film. I'd probably say it's my joint third favorite film of Lynch's. I think my favorite is Elephant Man and then Twin Peaks and then Mulholland Drive and Wild at Heart joined, I would say. Okay. Um, so I gave it... Eight out of ten awesome Gene the Pool Man mullets. <laughs> and I really like it. It's um I, I I sort of as I said, I think it's quite to me it's just seems like quite a straightforward film, so I sort of enjoy it from that point of view. The story, because it I find it so simple, it's not really about the whole over overall plot. It's about so many little scenes that I really enjoy, mm-hmm. rather than it as a whole I would say. But I do I do really enjoy it. All right. Well, I mean, I said at the beginning, it's my favorite Lynch thing. I think it's because I can laugh at the idiots on the internet uh, <laughs> while I just enjoy this collection of things that happen and don't try to put any greater meaning on it. So I'm going to give it nine old people in paper bags. But <laughs> they work in pairs, So, but I didn't want to give it an eight, but I can't give it a ten. So That's that half one? an old person. Ooh. <laughs> I, I, I'm splitting up the team, but just go, just go eight old people, and then the ninth one is the the hobo. Well, do yeah. we really consider old people full people? <laughs> That's what? true. No, no, we don't. <laughs> if they're half, okay, there we go. Nine old people in bags. <laughs> if uh, if bubble- or nine nine inane internet theories. Yeah, out of ten. If Bubba Hotep has taught me anything, the old people's souls are the smallest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nine angry Lilliputians in a bag. <laughs> okay, my rating system is also based on old people. But, uh, <laughs> I was going to give it <laughs> eight overly happy old people out of ten. Oh, we didn't talk about that. Yeah. Oh, I oh, love that. Bit. Smiling so much. It was I know. So weird. Was that nightmare inducing, Brad, for you? Uh, is, I'm I'm okay with old people as long as they're not granny rapping. That's okay. where I draw the line. Okay. <laughs> I'm an old lady, and I like to say I make cookies in a special way. <laughs> Every commercial from 1994. Uh, I've always suspected that, Brad, of you. <laughs> That's true. So I guess we'll get to some feedback. We have uh, actually a lot of feedback for this one. So we'll have to read it quickly. And try not to make fun of any theories, guys. <laughs> not a chance. <laughs> Actually, first up is one from, from Kevin Miller, and he 
send me a link to an uh, entire blogspot thing he did about it, so I'm not going to read that whole thing. But I will post the, the link to it on our Facebook page. Randy Oras. No, it's Rudy, sorry. Any volunteers for this one? I can read it. Hey guys, as always, thanks for the awesome podcast. It's always so truly, seriously funny. I'm so excited for this episode because Mulholland Drive is my favorite Lynch film. I just want to say, first of all, how awesome is Coco? I mean, come on. I bet we could have gotten more crazy old stories from her, Boxing Kangaroos, had it become a TV show. (laughs) And I wonder if certain set pieces like Mr. Rogue's Room and Club Silencio wouldn't have been revisited, or certain characters made to cross paths. Anyways, I have a question and a request. My question is, what do you think of all the elderly airport couple and their scenes? Thoughts and interpretations? (laughs) Well, we talked about that a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, my request is, please reenact <laughs> and describe the conversation that would occur if the log lady and a cowboy were to meet. Uh, pretty <laughs> please, with a tied cherry stem on top. Okay. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> Improv. Hmm. <laughs> Here's your characters. Location. Anybody? <laughs> Anybody? <laughs> log lady, cowboy, uh, ranch. <laughs> At a ranch for a birthday party. Go. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what would they say to each other? They would just sometimes there is a log, <laughs> sometimes <laughs> there is. <laughs> Claire, I find your cowboy accent so hilarious. I don't know, <laughs> it's just from you specifically. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I don't think that improv is happening. <laughs> no, I don't think so. It's kind of not on the spot. But thanks anyways, Rudy. What would have happened if? Instead of it being John Justice Wheeler, the cowboy that Audrey fell in love with in 12 weeks was the cowboy. <laughs> and he serenaded her. Oh, How cool would that have been? That would have been awesome. All right, so this one's from Chris Marsh. He says, imagine if the movie started with G- Gordon Coles shouting, Meanwhile, in Los Angeles... Okay, maybe not. <laughs> I, b- I believe, as many people do, that the first two-thirds are a dream and that the last third is reality, but shown out of sequence. Whatever whatever the logistics of the story are, I think Mulholland Drive is a very sensitive movie. Just as Lynch used the Red Room to give Laura Palmer peace at the end of Fire Walk With Me, he uses dreams to give Diane Selwyn all the things she can't have in reality. Love, talent, luck, confidence, success, and perfect teeth. Did her teeth change? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> when Betty and Rita go to Club Silencio, I take their crying to mean they that they know the dream and their time together is ending. Later, when Diane and Camilla are w- walking up the hill to Adam Kesher's house, Diane's longing for Camilla is palpable. As she looks at their clasped hands, the music swells and she hopes that hill never ends. It does, of course, as all hills do, and all dreams end. Sniffle, sniffle. But this movie has never stopped playing div- paying dividends in the 11 years since I first saw it. That's the work of a magician. I hope you mentioned David Lynch's 10 clues to understanding the movie, which were included in the DVD liner notes. I find these 10 clues to be equal parts red herring and horse shit. Ooh. <laughs> Regards, Chris Marsh. I think we agree. <laughs> All right. Uh, Harold Wallen's got one. So from Harold Wallen, back in the late 90s, word came out that David Lynch was working on a return to network television. At ABC, no less, the network that mishandled and ruined Twin Peaks only a few years earlier. The results were predictable. The suits found the pilot too slow and weird. They sent lots of notes. There was friction between the network and Lynch. And eventually the execs who greenlit the project left, turning it into an unwanted orphan. The pilot never aired and Lynch swore off television for good. Ironically, around this same time, HBO began airing The Sopranos, setting a new paradigm for quality television premised on giving the showrunner great artistic freedom. One can only wonder what Lynch would have done if he had given if he was given the same freedom and budget that HBO gave their three Davids, Chase, Milch, and Simon. Of course, Lynch did a much better job coming up with an ending than he did for the international version of the Twin Peaks pilot. The mm. film version does have some loose ends that don't quite n- that don't fit quite nearly into the it's Diane's dream slash fantasy explanation, but really I don't care. However, if you do, there's something called the internet, where one can spend several days reading various theories. Uh, you should kill yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Someone once pointed out that the title of the film is Mulholland Drive. Yes, it is. <laughs> there is no period at the end of the. What? <laughs> 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 Sorry. Who wasn't going to point that out? <laughs> it did happen once. Who is this wizard? (laughs) 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 
<laughs> do you want me to take over or? <laughs> I need to take over. I can do it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You know what though? Fine. You know what though? Check this out. Uh, what if it actually means doctor? <laughs> Mulholland doctor. <laughs> <laughs> the doctor is the protagonist of the film. <laughs> the one we never see. Yes. <laughs> Invisible protagonist. It's his dream. Okay. Oh, that, that should be the 20, 28th theory. Invisible protagonist. <laughs> <laughs> I think it is. <laughs> the viewer is the protagonist. Mm. All right. Okay. <sighs> Let me wipe my tears here. <laughs> Someone once pointed out that the title of a film is Mulholland Durr. <laughs> How am I supposed to read this? <laughs> Mulholland Drive. Mulholland DR. <laughs> There is no period at the end of DR to indicate drive. Okay, I can do it. I can yeah. do it. Do not take Mohal in DR if you are pregnant or may become pregnant. <laughs> it's just, it's just it does become class when you read it out loud. <laughs> Why don't you clip it and say someone once pointed out that there is no period at the end of the DR? Yes. <laughs> this is all saying it. <laughs> the end of the title to indicate drive. <laughs> That might, and that the DR might just as well stand for dream. <laughs> I like that because this film has all the David Lynch dream logic-y goodness I that I love. It. Okay, you said except, that. except the DR has never been an abbreviation for dream. And no, <laughs> ever. No. Hang on, I think we can crack this. You got an E, you got an A, and you got an M. Mm-hmm. You mix those up and you spell aim, which is. It sounds like A I M, and Hitman Joe shot everybody. He's the protagonist. Yes. <laughs> he should be the protagonist. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna put Mulholland Dr into an anagram solver. <laughs> <laughs> let's see what. It, let's see who the real protagonist is. <laughs> and if you add four. Aha! Uh-huh. Hand dorm lull. <laughs> Land mold hurl. <laughs> Damn Lord Hull. <laughs> Put it in a blue font because it is an object of change. Should I start from the, that, the Just, beginning of that paragraph? You're gonna, or? You're gonna break up. No, again. I'm gonna be fine. Okay, go. I'm gonna be fine. <clears throat> so do you want me to start from the beginning? Sure. Again? Okay. Sorry about that. That's all right. <clears throat> Someone mo- once pointed out that there is no period at the end of the dr in Mulholland Drive to indicate drive, and that the dr might just as well stand for dream. I like that because this film has all the David Lynch dream logic-y goodness that I love. And all of the David Lynch obsessions we have seen in tr- Twin Peaks. All sorts of movie stereotypes. The good girl, the pop singer, the gangster, the cowboy. And of course there are coffee, cigarettes, diners, shadows, amnesia, and doppelgangers. There is a Nancy Drew slash Hardy Boys type mystery. Oh, and the little man makes a cameo. Mm-hmm. Indeed Thanks, Harold. He does. Okay, this one's from Dan Daniel Norkin. Hey guys, I'm glad to see you haven't jumped ship just yet. I thought maybe the podcast was done after episode 35, but it's going to be fun sticking around for a Lynchian after party and explore his films too. Mulholland Drive is a great one to tackle after Blue Velvet, and it's interesting to think this is what Twin Peaks would have looked like had it become a film. Some say it's Lynch's most accessible work, but I also think it's the one that has the most staying power, especially when people think of him and what he did to and for Hollywood. Unlike a dead frog... (laughs) What? (laughs) Finish the sentence. (laughs) Let's not not get into this again. (laughs) Damn Lord Hull. (laughs) Damn Lord Hull. Unlike a dead frog in sixth grade science class, this will not be an easy thing to dissect. But I look forward to hearing what some first-timers thought of it. What did they think this movie was really about? Could they figure out a general timeline of events? What about the scene outside the, the diner, what some critics call the scariest moment in cinema? It's been years since I've seen it, but I remember this movie well, and there's no lack of talking points. The blue box, the tramp, the bag, the old folks, the girl, the apartment, the Hollywood sign, the audition, the awakening. It's as if every noun in this movie is saturated in symbolism. Every person, every place, everything matters. And how they matter, how they relate to this girl's tragic story, isn't an easy puzzle to put together. But the pieces are all there. Lynch just refuses to show us the box they came in and instead asks us to tell him what the picture looks like. Not literally, though. I don't think he'd want you calling him, especially not if you just saw the movie on the phone you're calling from. What? Yeah, he hates viewing movies on phones. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Fucking telephone. 
<laughs> <laughs> if the best art speaks for itself, Mulholland Drive is a masterpiece. Watch it again a year or two from now and you'll appreciate it even more. It may not be Twin Peaks, but it's of the same mould, from the same mind, and deserves the same respect. Dan. Thanks, Dan. So I guess a year or two from now we're going to have to watch it again. Yes. I think he might be <laughs> right. you've rewatched all of Twin Peaks as well. Yeah. Yes. I think, he, I think he might be right. If I watch this again later, I might like it more. I don't think I will. <laughs> did, did you only watch it once or twice, Brad? Oh, no, I watched it twice. Okay. I thought I thought I would like it better the second time, but I ended up liking it even less. Really? Yeah. Okay. Like, I was kind of bored. <laughs> <laughs> uh, You're dead inside, Brad. What? <laughs> I said Brad's dead inside. That's completely unrelated. <laughs> <laughs> this one's from Mark Pot- Potente. Sure. Um, where does it start? <laughs> you can never find where they start. It starts with hi you guys, and then there's oh, okay, a dramatic four line pause. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> hi you guys. Long space. <laughs> Being a massive Lynch fan, right from being introduced to his world when I saw Eraserhead whilst in my teens, I have followed your podcast. What? Being. Uh, mm. Okay, so this person. Okay, th- this right. person uses commas haphazardly. Okay. <laughs> being a massive Lynch fan, right from being introduced to his world when I saw Eraserhead whilst in my teens, I have followed your podcast from the beginning and I'm really enjoying it. <laughs> He's 14, by the way. <laughs> Maybe. I'm looking forward to Lynch. I'm looking forward to Lynch movie podcast, comma, having just listened to the Blue Velvet one. Period. Interesting. Interesting uh, shake up there. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned a majority of Lynch films, but seem to have overlooked one of his finest outings, Straight Story. It's one of the least Lynchian films he's made, but still has all the hallmarks of genius and against the norm in his films. It it has an amazingly emotional happy ending. That's I won't spoil it, but it's one <laughs> it you should watch. Did, but <laughs> it might even change your opinions of Lynch being known for extra space, his dark unsettling. <laughs> it also has an amazing battle minty <laughs> in quotes soundtrack. <laughs> battle minty in quotes comma soundtrack period. Keep up the great work, he says. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Thanks. Aww. Brad, if I didn't know any better, I'd, I'd think you were a proofer for noticing that extra space in there. <laughs> well, it's it's the combination of the arbitrary comments <laughs> and the extra space. I I agree about straight story. Straight story is awesome, by the way. You think we should do it? I wanna I wanna watch it. All right. Yeah. Uh, you might as well. You might as well do all of them. Might as well. You know. out. We should yeah, also gotta catch them all. <laughs> I think that Big Ed Hurley is in it. Oh, is he? So that's reason enough. I think he's got a, a very small part in it. So there's a Twin Peaks, another Twin Peaks leak. <laughs> very tenuous one. He's also in Dune, but that didn't help that movie. <laughs> <laughs> right, we should totally review Dumbland. Dumbland? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I review that. <laughs> Anyways, Evan? Okay. Who is this? It's Zach Stetson. Okay. Zach says... He's got a great name. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Shit, you threw me off. Okay. Uh, Zach says, Mulholland Drive is by far my favorite Lynch film. Relating it to Twin Peaks, no need. Uh, I feel the cowboy character in the film is very similar to the giant from Twin Peaks. They both give advice and are both somewhat cryptic, the giant more so. By far the creepiest scene in the film is the scene where Louise Bonner shows up at Betty's door and says, quote, something is wrong, something bad is happening, and no, that's not what she said. That one, that one didn't really freak me out at all. <laughs> no, I mean... Uh, that's just what old people do. Mm. <laughs> she, but Lynch is a genius, so he mixed it up. So that's not what she said. Ah. <laughs> uh, but that that freaks Zach out every time. Battle of Menti's score really helps to create the unsettling mood during that scene. Another scene that freaks me out is the scene with the man behind Winkies. And there are so many other standout scenes, such as the audition scene that is played nice and close. Ugh. And of course, Club Silencio. Hope you all enjoyed the film. Uh, we got one left. This one's from Dave Maraska. Um, Aloha, Twin Peaks podcast, and welcome to the beginning of the new insanity that is David Lynch's Mulholland Drive. I remember when this movie was in theaters, my sister was at NYU, and a bunch of her friends from the Tisch School of Performing Arts went to see it and came home crying from how unintelligible the story was. (laughs) I know I've mentioned it several times on your Facebook page, but Mulholland Drive is going to prove to be a pretty stroll through a park compared to what's coming in Inland Empire. Mm. 
<laughs> Lost Highway, my personal favorite Lynch work next to Twin Peaks, is pretty mind-fuckingly batshit crazy, too. Uh, one of the things I love about Mulholland Drive is that even if you don't read the New Yorker article, it's a Lynch work that totally harkens back to Twin Peaks in the look and feel and interaction of the characters. Wait, 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 hold on. Mm. Even if you don't read the New Yorker article... I... Now, granted, we haven't read the New Yorker article, mm. but why would you need to read the New Yorker article? To, to see the Twin Peaks thing? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I could see it, yeah. Who are these people that can't watch things without reading things? <laughs> Me. Uh, those, are, <laughs> those are deaf people, Brad, and they need the closed captions on. <laughs> oh, yeah, <I'm> me. <laughs> Please cut that. <laughs> I can't hear it. Uh, Sorry, what, Evan? I didn't hear that. <laughs> I just signed it. Yeah, but that was in American Sign Language, and I don't know that one. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you can go. <laughs> uh, Learning after my first viewing that it was originally intended to be the pilot episode of a new serialized drama only serves to reinforce this and explains how disjointed the film feels. It almost helps to watch the film and let it wash over you more than trying to actively tie a linear story together. This movie is anything but linear in its logic. In fact, figuring the movie out is one of the most fun parts of watching it. Unlike nope. almost, <laughs> unlike almost all other Lynch Lynch films. There are solid clues you can take from the opening moments of the film that serve as a great explanation for the events of the film. Anyone guess what some of those clues are? I've included a list below, but take a shot at guessing first. Don't be cheaters. Uh, does anyone want to guess? Are there ten of them? I think so. Well, I mean, it's like it, these aren't clues. These are We're obvious not... things. There's a jitterbug dance, and there's the pillow, because it's all in her head. That's not a mystery. It's blatantly obvious. Hmm. These aren't big secrets. You may not catch it the first time, but it's more than blatantly obvious. There was nothing blue in there, so... That pillow should have been blue. I <laughs> uh, love the show, guys. Wish there were more episodes for you to cover. Yet another reason to lament how short Twin Peaks' run was. Dave the Clone Maraska. And then he lists those clues that uh, Claire... Uh, that are not clues, sir. Those clues are popular. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> well, we ripped this movie a new one. <laughs> Aww. I still like it. <laughs> you guys can stop listening to us if you want. <laughs> I'm revising to 5.5. 5. <laughs> I think um, I think I think you're gonna get more people not listening to an episode I was on. <laughs> <laughs> Someone else is gonna quit. Yeah. Quit the group. Uh, a dramatic <laughs> of uh. I mix it up. I'm a loose cannon. Yes. <laughs> if you're gonna leave the group, it's gonna be my fault. Damn it. <laughs> it's my job. <laughs> uh, wild card uh, so that's the end of that one uh, Claire and Evan thanks for coming on you guys have anything to plug uh, X-Files podcast starting in October Ooh. Um, intro cast to that um, we should have the Facebook group up I think relatively soon because there's been a lot of interest and I'll be on that with um, Tammy and Robin and someone else I can't remember who um, Brad something? I don't know. Anyway, um, and yeah, it will be awesome. So it'll be starting up in October. Sweet. All right, Evan? Um, I have a podcast for which I'm no longer producing new episodes, but it's still up. Sweet. I don't know. What's it called? It's called This Podcast Contains Spoilers. I have uh, 50 episodes, uh, and they're at thispodcast.wordpress.com. I, I did do an episode on the Baxter, so you can hear about more about Justin Thoreau. Sweet. And it's a great film, and I, I watched that film after listening to the episode in the backstage, and I love that film now. It's great. So thank you, Evan. <laughs> <laughs> I am to please. Uh, Brad, yes, you guys can hear me on the Ramjack podcast, where we talk about wacky things like snakes and summer camps, <laughs> <laughs> and Mr. Belvedere and Saved by the Bell, and maybe Baywatch Nights. <laughs> <laughs> on the long list, where is that? Is that going to be after Perfect Strangers? or? Uh, you know, pepper a few in randomly. <laughs> you, you can't really lose those, you know, long form uh, plot threads that Baywatch Nights was famous for. Mm. Oh, <laughs> David Hasselhoff fighting ghosts and Vikings <laughs> on the beach. That was amazing. <laughs> it does. Mm, yeah. All right. Uh, thanks everyone for listening. Uh, next time we're going to be reviewing. Yeah, we're sorry. <laughs> we're sorry. For our I'm show. not. <laughs> Whatever. I still like the movie. I just don't like the people who. <laughs> write about it. <laughs>
And next time we're going to be watching, I think, Wild at Heart. Nice! Wild at Heart. We are, and we'll have a, actually a good copy of it this time, because our copy of Mulholland Drive was really shitty. Yes. <laughs> oh. Well, that's why you didn't like it. <laughs> no, that, no. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Okay, bye. Bye. Goodbye. you. Thanks for listening. Check us out on twitter.com slash twinpeakscast. Search for the Twin Peaks Podcast group on Facebook. And visit us on twinpeakspodcast.blogspot.com. Email your feedback to twinpeakspodcast at gmail.com. Here's a tune for you guys. Okay. Don't do anything I wouldn't do.